Hello, I'm Mark Schildhaus, and because things on the internet seem to lose their date references pretty quick, today is Thursday, June 6th, 2024, the 80th anniversary of the D-Day invasion into uh, Normandy and Fortress Europe. On uh, May 22nd, which was a Wednesday, 2024, uh, during our uh, May vacation into <coughs> Nevada and uh, the uh, Yosemite area of California, we visited the Nevada State Railroad Museum in Carson City. And uh, let me apologize first of all. I had a few things on my mind uh, when we were there, uh, a bit rushed, and my photos aren't quite um, in the order that I normally expect them to do. I normally work really hard to make sure that uh, whatever signage is available for the car, for the vehicle, for, for the item on display, that I, I uh, get it. And for some reason, um, and I'm not sure why, uh, I have pictures of items, and some of them didn't have signage, so I, I'm making a, assumptions as what they are. For example, the uh, Model T and Model A there were two Model T's and a Model A, I think, uh, on display, and there was no signage for them. And uh, so I can't take photos of signage that, aren't, that isn't there. Uh, but normally I work really hard on trying to keep my signage and the items uh, together so I know exactly what I'm looking at. And to this museum, it, it just didn't work out. And there are some really uh, unique items there. Uh, one of them that you're going to see is the uh, McKean motor car, which is 70 feet long. Uh, they do run it, and they couldn't maintain the engine uh, that it was equipped with, so they yanked that out and put a uh, cat diesel in it. Uh, the cat diesel powers some hydraulic pumps. The hydraulic pumps are, are controlled through a valve system, and the uh, uh, axles have hydraulic motors on them. So they've kept it as as best they could it's really well maintained uh, but it's uh, a, a distinct modification of of the original uh, cat diesels didn't come in mckean motor cars but uh, you'll see that and they're they're working trying to keep these things running and if you can't get parts for the original engines uh, what do you do you you uh, adjust you adapt you you move on a really good museum. As I said, I apologize for the fact that I don't have positive correlation on some of the photos, so I just made the best thing I could. Plus, for some reason, a number of the photos I took were out of uh, focus, and I don't understand why, because the next place we went to, uh, everything came out very well, like it, like it normally does, which was kind of interesting. The one thing I really wish museums would do is figure out how to uh, have non-gloss signs, signs that don't reflect light in the area. And on the signage in this museum, uh, there was a lot, lot of reflection. However, let me say this, and let me make this perfectly clear. This is a really good, really clean, really nice museum, reasonable admission cost, whatever it was. No discount for seniors, no discount, or I don't think there was a discount for seniors, no discount for AARP, no discount for military. And uh, the docents, uh, I asked several questions, um, probably 15, 20 to four or five docents or staff members and probably got answers to three of them. Uh, seems most of them didn't understand the question or, or didn't have the information. Okay, let's move on with it. Really good museum, really good stay. Uh, we spent probably three hours there and uh, really nice parking, uh, easy to get to, well labeled, everything, really nice place and uh, highly worth the visit. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoy it. This is the entrance to the Nevada State Railroad Museum and the buildings that it's in. It is well marked on the highway, plus you see the steamer that is out there. You get to cross over some railroad tracks. According to the uh, docents and the volunteers and the people that were there, uh, a number of these trains are still operational, which is like really cool. Uh, plan on spending probably two to three hours. There is plenty of parking out in the area and it's uh, generally a really nice visit. I 
in a rush um, and a degree of excitement uh, got my pictures all confused so if some of uh, the, my photos are misidentified sorry about that I would say there were five or six engines on display I didn't count them and I still haven't counted them and I'm gonna try to run through the engines first uh, the Virginia and Truckee number 12 the Genoa is a uh, Baldwin that was sitting there uh, right at the entrance if you look on that first picture right behind that is the entrance where you pay your admission fee it is absolutely beautifully maintained and if you look at the smokestack you can confirm that it is a wood burner plus there's wood in the tender it was beautifully maintained very very clean uh, they were asking you on all of them not to climb on them so we didn't the write-ups for the engines like this Virginia and Truck E number 21, the JW Bowker, uh, were really informative and uh, they tell how the the engines came to the railroad, where the engines went to because a number of the, all of them I think were sold off and then reacquired for the museum. But another beautifully maintained Baldwin sitting in the main barn. There were two barns uh, and this one was in the main barn. Uh, with the uh, number 12 sitting next to it. A number of the cars and engines that are in the Virginia Truckee Museum and that were on the Virginia Truckee uh, line when it was running uh, ended up in Hollywood and the uh, Virginia Truckee number two, uh, 22, the NEO, uh, was one of the uh, trains that made it into a number of different uh, movies and television shows whatever else and another beautifully maintained engine the McKean motor car 22 was uh, an interesting thing and my exterior picture of it didn't turn out so it's going to be a picture of a model and you'll see some models later in the video uh, it was it is an operating car and uh, because the original engine is not uh, functional was not functional uh, they've replaced the original engine with a cat and uh, what this cat diesel does is it powers hydraulic pumps and the hydraulic pumps uh, energize the hydraulic motors down on the axle a uh, really interesting car really interesting system and they're trying to keep the car running even if the engine is totally out of place with the rest of the car. The Glenbrook is not a uh, Virginia Truckee uh, locomotive. It is a Carson and Tahoe Lumber and Flume Company and Flumes are the chutes uh, that had water that carried uh, w timber, uh, cut trees down to the next point and uh, when that um, when the lumber business uh, came to an end it was uh, transferred up to Lake Tahoe Railway and Transportation Company where it hauled tourists for a number of years and then it uh, when when that ended it was put in front of the old mint uh, the um, Nevada State Museum and uh, where it sat for a number of years and then later on it was brought over and then uh, restored and back to operating condition at the Nevada State Railroad Museum. So they are working to keep these things uh, running and beautifully looking. This HK Potter locomotive which was named Joe Douglas uh, there was no signage that I found for it. It is a wood burner. It's a, it's a narrow gauge wood burner. It was uh, just sitting in the second barn and uh, the Dosen that was sitting by it uh, was talking to somebody else so I didn't bother them. The Virginia and Truckee uh, number 25 locomotive is another Baldwin and it was sitting off in the uh, second uh, hangar, the second second bay, the second building, second bay and uh, in my understanding is it was um, operational and by looking at its smokestack this is uh, either an oil or a uh, coke or coal burner it is not a wood burner it has a straight stack they had this speeder sitting there speeder number two don't know what happened to speeder number one uh, looks like it needs a little work 
when we were actually riding the uh, Virginia and Truckee between Carson City and Silver City, Nevada, <clears throat> on our train ride, um, I did notice that the train was being followed by the speeder <clears throat> in both directions. Not sure why, but uh, there were two or three guys uh, with a toolbox sitting on a speeder that were following us both times. The Sheffield Velocis, Velociped, uh, if you read it, is kind of interesting. The uh, George Sheffield uh, uh, made the original one so that he could ride the uh, right away uh, in Michigan, which he didn't have the right to do, but he did. And um, on one of his trips, which he did in the dark, he found a broken rail and managed to stop the train before there was an accident. So uh, the company said, okay, we'll let you ride on it right away. Thank you very much. Can you make us one? Uh, we would like one, and he ended up making a company, forming a company to make, uh, obviously, several of them. Uh, this one is actually a reconstruction from parts that were recovered from a buried one uh, that had been burned down by uh, Reno or Las Vegas or somewhere. There were several cabooses, uh, the Virginia and Truckee caboose number nine, uh, the, the car at the end of the train, and the, in it appears that with the uh, VNT that a number of the cabooses were actually also passenger cars or um, took on freight or luggage uh, as they went. And they were, like the rest of the cars, they were in uh, pretty darn good shape. And this one here is sitting underneath uh, what is a smoke funnel. So a steamer would come in or would be placed underneath this and when it had the steam up uh, it was a it was an area to uh, vent without without getting too much of it in the building. As I said or I forgot to say uh, I, some of the pictures and and uh, the the cars the items that go with the pictures seem to be out of place for some reason I haven't been able to figure it out so uh, caboose number eight, uh, I, I don't have what I can guarantee you as a picture. And I'm, as I said, I, some of these pictures may be misassociated with their signs. Um, sorry about that. But uh, there were a number of cars there. And uh, the uh, Virginia and Truckee uh, Railroad, the caboose number one, uh, which I only have these uh, these. Uh, this one picture of the interior of this if I'm not mistaken and I, I'm not exactly sure so I'm leaving this in here. Uh, parked outside was a what appeared to be a Western Pacific uh, caboose and there was no signage for it. This children's play on engine had a name on it and I think it's Whistling Willie or something like that and I for some reason I don't have a picture of it. I, I'm not sure where or how I, I would have sure tried to get it. Uh, really cool and it's uh, for children of all ages It Ward Kimball has a uh, quote on the stand Ward Kimball was one of the original Disney artists and Ward Kimball is the guy who informed Walt Disney that you can actually buy full-size trains and own it and along the side was a uh, play train set and I have one of these that's I've got so many pieces that it takes about four boxes to hold it uh, it's amazing what you can buy on eBay uh, next door and uh, whatever social media for really really cheap and just have a lot of fun so we got a lot of this stuff. The Tucson Cornelia and Gila Bend Railroad the Edwards Railcar 401 uh, was a beautifully done interior repaired interior and uh, I understood they use this when they run their trains. I'm not sure what um, the exterior of this car was because I didn't get the correlation to it. I, I, I'm, and I apologize for that. This covered gondola was sitting there and I have no pictures of any signage associated with it. I didn't find any. Uh, it was, it looks like it has been set up as a, uh, tourist car. So when they run their, um, their, their trains, their tourist engines, uh, their, their tourist trains that, uh, this is probably one of them that they, use as a, a passenger carrier. The J.G. Brill uh, coach number 12 of the VNT Virginia and Truckee Railroad is one of those one is one of those cars that uh, showed up in a lot of the movies. It was evidently sold to Hollywood. It was used as a Hollywood prop and then reacquired and it is uh, in worn but nice condition uh, and the 
uh, it's a nice train. It's a nice car. The Virginia and Truckee number uh, 1005 was uh, built by the Central Pacific Railroad and it was brought up there. It was sitting in the back. You couldn't really get a good look at it or a good picture. It was surrounded by quite a bit of stuff. Very old, very well maintained, uh, very well probably restored uh, boxcar. And uh, this is the, the, the museum had real quality and class when on, on maintaining and keeping these cars. There are times you just have to last, laugh. Uh, the ghost girl and car number nine. Okay, I've never seen a ghost. I can't tell you if a ghost exists. I can't tell you if they don't exist. I can't prove it one way or the other. So I just leave my mind open. Uh, my grandmother uh, claimed that she talked to ghosts in her house, uh, in her house uh, back in Chicago. Uh, the previous owner uh, to their acquisition of it, her, her and her husband's acquisition of it, uh, hung himself in the garage because of the death of his wife at an untimely time. And uh, she evidently had conversations with both of them. So I can't prove it one way or the other. Uh, I trust my grandmother. Maybe this car is really haunted. There were three that I caught uh, there were three motor vehicles, car type vehicles, uh, a Model T uh, passenger type truck, transport, taxi cab t thing, uh, then the uh, uh, car and the Model A and all, all very, very nice uh, condition, but there were no signs to explain anything. And uh, the one docent I asked said he didn't have any information on it. Back in the time when the University of Nevada was not real big, when it had about 200 students uh, at the turn of the century, 1900 time frame, uh, the railroad and the university, or maybe railroads in the university, cooperated and uh, worked with their engineering department and the production shop for the railroads, and uh, and the mutually supported each other. Uh, you train us the hand skills, we'll train, we'll train you the, the uh, brain skills. And these uh, five slides overall show what it was. And they made an operating uh, one-eighth scale, I believe it is, uh, example. Can't be one-eighth, it's got to be smaller than that. Anyways, they, they made an operating steam engine and they put it on display. This area addressed Promontory Summit, which is where the Golden Spike was driven. It wasn't Promontory Point. We visited Promontory Summit, uh, National Park's historical location uh, last year. Uh, it was great. They brought out the two replica uh, locomotives, the um, Jupiter and the uh, number 60, whatever. Uh, beautiful, beautiful event. And this display, and I'm going to let the video run, uh, shows you how they laid track. It was really cool. Splicing and spiking was done behind the advancing rail cars. Only once for 10 miles of track to go for a single day. On that day, all 3,520 rails were unloaded by the same eight man fleet of rail lanes. They rushed the cars and cars to the main exchange for loaded cars. Each rail was 30 feet long and weighed 560 pounds. Once the rails were spliced together and spiked to the cross ties, the missing ties were distributed from the supply train and placed. This starts with uh, part of the track layout on that back wall and some of the information about how they set up their schedules and whatever else. And then it progresses to a really be <laughs> a, a huge map on the floor and I just walked over it with my camera.
hey, it's correct, it's promontory summit. If you read this, it's Jack and Margie Gibson, and then the interaction, it's uh, George L. Richardson, and it was his models, and these are beautiful models, and they're, there's uh, the history of how they came over there, and it looks like um, uh, George Richardson's children are the ones that uh, purchased these models, and then donated them or sold them to the museum. I'm just going to let you scroll through them. Uh, really beautiful. It was in a beautiful display off the side. I love it when people tell me that uh, it's military time, the 24-hour clock is military time. If you chase history, the 24-hour clock is actually railroad time. And this particular display talks about how the railroads actually set up the time zones, the four time zones for the United States of America. And they did that because they were interacting because up to that point, the point that they standardized it, each town set its own time. So a train could leave town A, uh, drive for, uh, run the rails for 20 minutes and arrive at town B six minutes before it left uh, town A. And, and it didn't work because if the trail, if the uh, rails crossed, if the roadbeds crossed, how do you sync these trains so that they don't inappropriately meet each other at the crossing? The railroads gave us the time zones, the railroads standardized our times, and so that they could write abbreviated schedules, they also gave us the 24-hour clock because with the 24-hour clock, you can put one through uh yeah, 1 through 24 across the top, and then in the column underneath it, you only need to put the two digits for the minutes, and that saves a lot of time when you're building schedules. Because states uh, could establish the rules for the trains that were operating on them it w within their state boundaries, it was kind of critical as to when you cross the state line. So here's one of the markers that defined uh, where Nevada and California met and where the train passed it. Over the years there's been a number of ways to connect rail cars and uh, you'll notice this one. This is one of the ones that came and went. Uh, the Lincoln pin design. Uh, it required people to be between the two cars which was a very dangerous operation. Hobos and railroads just seem to go together, and this is I've seen this in several locations, several uh, railroad museums. The uh, hobo signage, uh, it's usually pretty consistent. It seems to be a uh, semi-formal language, and uh, the museum had their display, which was, it, it makes you giggle. Uh, it makes the kids giggle. There was quite a bit of signage on the wall of the museum and one of the things I wish museums would do is figure out how to do these so they do not reflect. There's going to be a fair amount of uh, dead uh, air on this. I'm going to set these up just to scroll through. But they talk about a number of things as we go, and I'm not going to try and keep them in sync. And uh, they talk about the signals, and, and they show you some of the lanterns. They talk about how Hollywood saved uh, the Virginia Truckee Railroad. And they're talking about how the Virginia and Truckee uh, Railroad saved Hollywood. 
because when they needed the uh, Golden Spike trains for a film, they used the Virginia and Truckee uh, locomotives and, and put them up. Now remember that the uh, locomotive coming from uh, Central Pacific was a wood burner, so it had to have that funnel uh, type staff, stack and the um, Central Pacific um, coming, Union Pacific coming from the east, I think it was, uh, was an oil, was a uh, coke burner. Uh, so it, it has a straight stack. And the engines are appropriate uh, the, for what they needed to be, even if they weren't exactly the, the right type of engines. A number of uh, issues that they, they just kind of address with these signs. If you want to stop them and read them, it's really informative, really nice. I just wish they were not as reflective so you could take a good photo of them because there was just absolutely no way to get good photos of most of these signs. legend of Whistlin' Billy, and I think that's the name of that kids' children's play locomotive, is a map of the railroads uh, that were in Nevada, and they're interesting to try to follow. Another map of the railroads in Nevada, and I think it's a little more you know, realistic and the uh, Virginia and Truckee Railroad shop rules, which are interesting to read. And a graphic, you could buy this evidently in the uh, gift shop, and we did go into the gift shop for a little bit. There's also supposedly an equipment guide available for purchase in the gift shop. Uh, I looked for it. I didn't see it. It didn't stand out. Maybe it was there. There's a standard narrow gauge, uh, dual gauge uh, turntable out there so they can turn the engines around and it's not an original. It was, it's a replica of another turntable they found several miles away and they duplicated it as close to uh, perfect as they could. Uh, they did a very nice job on it and um, they're on, on some of the turntables I've seen, there's a railroad rail uh, on the on the uh, circumference of the pit uh, that also helps hold the weight so that you don't have to be quite as perfectly balanced to get it to work easily. So this sandstone block uh, doesn't look like it's a real precision cut, but evidently it was important, so they put it in the museum. Okay. Uh, but the uh, we did tour the Capitol Complex and we did tour the Kit Carson Trail and saw a number of really beautiful homes, some of them that were made from uh, from blocks and this really big grindstone uh, that was sitting there and my wife is going, you want me to stand next to it to show you how big this is? Okay, I will do that. Because of the pistons, uh, the valves, the rings associated with steam engines, uh, brass machinists are critical guys, and James F. Tra uh, Tranter uh, had his, has his toolbox uh, on display at the museum, which um, some interesting tools in it. I, I love tools. I like to collect tools. The sign for this is this is an operating a steam propulsion system. The D valve is there. The Johnson bar is there. Uh, the feedbacks are there. And if you were to apply air pressure to it or steam pressure, it would operate. And it was designed as a training aid uh, for the mechanics that were going to be working on the steam engines. A uh, display of some of the stuff that was used in communications with the railroad. There's a telegraph key, a telephone. Uh, several telegraph keys actually and uh, and the typewriter so um, and on this sign it's the R and T R Y 
so uh, railroad railway um, I wonder what the real name was it appears to be railway around the outside uh, in the back were a couple of cars that were sitting there kind of neglected maybe they were beyond the uh, capability of restoration maybe they were being used for spare parts and a couple of tires for steam engines the the wheels on steam engines have tires on the outside and what you do is you make the intersection the hub uh, as cold as possible and then you heat up the tire the outside uh, the inside contracts the outside the uh, tire expands you slide the two of them together let the inside warm up let the outside cool down and they bind and you can replace them through their lifetime because these wear down these wear, wear out and then there is the uh, required uh, freight wagon and the freight wagons usually have steel wheels and that's to reduce rolling friction as you move them around we spent about two to two and a half hours at the uh, Nevada State Railroad Museum it was a beautiful display uh, good parking uh, clean uh, nice to walk around we asked a couple of questions uh, didn't get answers to all of our questions uh, the docents volunteers were busy with other people or, or just chatting amongst themselves uh, but it is a beautiful museum uh, I thought the price was reasonable I don't remember how much it was and uh, the stuff that's on display most of it is very nicely marked some of it is uh, is not marked and I and I apologize I lost the correlation between the signage and the items we we're looking at so some of mine might be a little off but this was a fantastic visit we really enjoyed it it's a nice place to stop and see thanks for watching hope you enjoyed it